Alrighty, welcome back everyone. We just talked about the winners and the losers from this past weekend. The biggest winners were us. Just getting to watch all the craziness that went down on Saturday. That was all that college football is about. No two ways about that. But <clears throat> let's get into all the games that we didn't have a chance to get to yesterday. And I want to get to a couple of teams here for a second. But let's start with that Boston College-Virginia game, because this one was weird. I didn't necessarily expect this result by any means on Saturday, and we should talk about Virginia just a little bit here. A huge win for them, outscored uh, BC 18-0 in the fourth quarter. Really, really good stuff from the Hoos to start their season. I think they're playing really good football. You have Anthony Colandria just running this offense very effectively, not necessarily doing anything spectacular, but at the end of the day, moving the ball down the field, making life a little bit tough for them, and then they're playing really good defense. You know, being able to hold Thomas Castellanos in is a huge, huge win for them, and he had one of the strangest fumbles I've ever seen. It was a return for a touchdown for Virginia, kind of to put this game on ice. Overall, a relatively sloppy game from the Golden Eagles. No two ways about that. Thomas Castellano's kind of getting back from an injury, so not necessarily all that unexpected, but definitely one that they had pegged as a win on their schedule. No two ways about that, and kind of knocks them out of the ACC race. So a tough loss for Boston College. As for Virginia, I wanted to touch on them today because... I think things are going to about to get a little bit ugly for the Hoos. I think you go to uh, Louisville this upcoming weekend, at Clemson right after, at Pitt, at Notre Dame, SMU, still on your schedule. So it's going to get rough. I feel pretty confident about that for Virginia. But at the end of the day, 4-1 and one right now, big-time win in conference. Got to give you a little bit of love for the time being. Then we got to talk about the service academies because that was 34-7. I apologize. 34-7 was the score there, but Blake Horvath was downright special in this game. 9 for 15, 134 yards through the air, 19 carries, 115, two touchdowns on the ground. This dude is doing everything for this team. He's absolutely incredible. Maybe the most impactful player or impactful quarterback for the, uh, his team in the entire country. He does so many different things. And we'll talk about another guy that's very impactful for his team at the end of the day. And whenever you can make Air Force more effective through the air than on the ground, you're probably going to win that game. And that's exactly what the case was on Saturday. 3.3 yards per carry is absolutely elite against a, a service academy where they're going to be running the ball and they're going to get at least a couple of yards because of the cut blocking that they do. So a huge win for uh, Navy gets them that first win in the Commander-in-Chief trophy race. And we'll see what happens uh, going forward. I think... I feel pretty confident that Air Force is the odd man out here, I'll be totally honest with you, but uh, Navy, Army could be on a little bit of a collision course at the end of the year, and let's talk about their counterparts. They went to work this weekend, and this is a team that is just really good. I'll be totally honest with you guys. Bryson Daly is absolutely awesome. He's matching at every single turn what Blake Horvath is doing over there at Navy. He's 5, and f five for 5, 140 yards, 2 touchdowns on Saturday, also had 13 carries, 110 yards, and 2 touchdowns on the ground. This dude is outright special, and he's one of the best quarterbacks in the entire country right now. And they do have some relatively tough games coming up. I think they'll roll against UAB this upcoming weekend because that's an outright dumpster fire right now. And then you got East Carolina into a bye. There's a real, there's not a crazy world by any means that when Notre Dame comes to town to play Miami or to play Army, I don't know where Miami came from to play Army, they could be undefeated and coming off a bye. That would be very, very dangerous for Navy. That is not a thing that this defense wants to face, especially against an offense that you can have the best defense called. It probably won't matter. They're probably going to get at least a couple of yards and just continue to wear you down, but cannot be happier about this. It's so cool to see these two teams undefeated. Frankly, I think we could see them undefeated for quite some time. Now, they do both play Navy, so or they do both play uh, Notre Dame, but we'll figure out what happens there. First time they've both been undefeated at this time since 1945. So out, outright special. Cannot wait to see what happens the rest of the year. And I would love a reality where they play in the American title and then the next week they play each other in a regular season game. Would be absolutely insane and possibly would send one of those guys to the playoff before they play each other in the regular season. Then you got West Virginia, Oklahoma State. And Oklahoma State's just not very good, guys. I, I There was a point in me that I felt like maybe they can flip a switch. Maybe they can get Ollie Gordon going, and maybe this team is a little bit more dangerous down the stretch. They're just getting railroaded. And Ollie Gordon had 13 carries, 50 yards. He's just, he is who he is at this point. You know, a defense stopping him is not some Herculean feat at this point. It's just kind of what defenses do. And West Virginia seems to have found their formula, at least in conference play. 60 ru 65 rushes in this game, 389 yards on the ground. They're not doing anything through the air. 16 passes through the air, so I think they know what Garrett Green's real attribute is, and it's his toughness in open field. He can run through guys. He's very, very uh, physical, and one of those guys that can cause a lot of problems for you. So West Virginia has become really interesting. They have two losses out, out of conference and are starting their play 2-0. and So now you got three games against Iowa State, Kansas State, and Arizona. 
that's your season. No two ways about that. You go two and one in those, you're very much in the fight. There's no two ways about that. You go three and oh, you're probably the favorite in that conference going forward. So it's one of those teams that started the year really, really rough. And we were sitting there thinking, okay, West Virginia is just not very real this year. And maybe they're still not. Maybe Oklahoma State's just that unreal. But the reality is a huge win for this team. And I think could kind of set them off on a really interesting season. Then we got JMU, a really tough loss for the James uh, for James Madison here. ULM is a really interesting team going forward. They have one loss, and it's at Texas. So I think we need to put a little bit more respect on the Warhawks' name. They're playing really, really good football. If they win out, they are absolutely your rep in the group of five. I feel pretty confident in that. I think when... I guess Boise State could cause some problems, and there's some other teams that could get in that uh, fray, but the reality is this team's playing really, really good football right now. The defense is incredible. 20 for 47 for a Barnett, 251 uh, 51 yards, but when you're throwing 47 passes, you're probably going to get downfield at least a couple of times. They had a, f- a fumble return for a score. They forced four uh, turnovers on downs in this game, so to me, those are turnovers. To me, that's five turnovers in this game for ULM. This team is definitely one to watch. I think when you look at the Sun Belt right now, it's pretty wide open. You had a uh, South Alabama team, or not South Alabama, you had um, Texas State go down this past weekend, and it's a number of things opening up in that conference. Maybe ULM's the one that kind of takes the cake and ends up being the Warhawks in the conference title game and possibly playing for a CFP berth. Then we had the fight in Florida, and Florida pretty comfortably won this one. I know the score is a little bit closer, but uh, UCF scored a touchdown late in this one to make it look a little bit better. UCF is just all over the place. They missed a huge chance in this game. I think they are still in it. No two ways about that for the Big 12, but you have Iowa State, BYU, Arizona, Utah still on their schedule. I can say pretty confidently that UCF is not going to be a factor in the Big 12 race. And then for Florida, It was just about getting these fans a little bit excited for football, and you did that. So at the end of the day, no real reason to uh, go after Florida by any means in this game. I think Graham Mertz is finally playing Graham Mertz football. There were a number of games early on in the season where it felt like he was forcing it just a little bit too much, trying to make that one play, and it's not necessarily who he is. He went 19 for 23, 179 yards, a touchdown in this game. DJ Lagway went 4 for 4, 50 yards. There's still so much up in the air for what Florida is going to be because If Billy Napier leaves, this entire thing could crumble around him. A number of guys could leave through the portal, and then you're trying to figure out where you stand. But at the end of the day, being excited for uh, Saturdays might just be enough for these Florida fans right now. So a huge win here. I think you move forward and see where you stand. you got a Georgia game coming up in a couple of weeks that could be a nightmare. But at the end of the day, you know, fighting in these games is probably enough for Florida going forward. Georgia Tech was a team that knocked off one of the undefeateds in the country. They are 4-2 and 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 2-2 in conference. One of those teams that I think is definitely on the outside looking in in the ACC, but a couple of things happen, it could get crazy for this team. I think they're really dangerous. They're not necessarily an elite team by any means, but they can run the ball really effectively, and when they absolutely need to, they can get a couple of takes away, takeaways on defense, and that's really all you need in the ACC this year. Uh, and we talked about going into this game, whichever running back had the better day, you were probably going to see that team win. Well, Jamal Haynes went for 19, 128 yards. Star Thomas, 14 carries, 48 yards. So, That was the game. No two ways about that. Georgia Tech was in pretty good control for the majority of this game. It was a little bit of a fight early, but Georgia Tech seemed to be in pretty good control. Didn't make a ton of mistakes, and that D-line for Georgia Tech played really good football. Uh, I think this is one of those things that Tech fans have been very, very worried about over the first couple of weeks of the season, and being able to do it against a team that is going to play physical and is going to run the ball downhill has to make you feel a little bit better. This is one of those teams that they're not elite. I don't necessarily expect them to be in Charlotte at the end of the year, but I do expect every single team that they play, whether they're elite or not, to get a really, really good fight from Georgia Tech. I can promise you that. And we had a huge game over in the Big 12 that we didn't get a chance to talk about because of how crazy it was. But Texas Tech gets a huge win, moves to 3-0 and in that conference, and Taj Brooks is a problem. He's 21 carries, 128 yards, three touchdowns in this game. He is becoming the very best running back in that conference, and I think there's a couple other guys that have a little bit of fight here, but man, Taj Brooks is playing elite football. In the past game, I think they do want to find more people. Caleb Douglas was really the only guy that got a number of targets in this game. You're going to have to spread the ball out a little bit more. Micah Hudson did get a catch in this game, so hopefully he's a part of the offense going forward, but definitely one of those teams that just kind of hanging out. They don't necessarily, they have, you know, tough games coming up, no two ways about that, but the reality is this is a really dangerous team, and one of those teams that anytime they get on a football field is going to cause problems for the other team, especially if Barry Morton keeps playing this elite football. So as for Arizona, I think 
you're officially riding a line. You're officially on the line of, you know, making the conference championship or being an 8-4, and 7-5 and five team and being very frustrated. I still think there's a team that can flip the switch. Whenever you have Noah Fafita and T-Mac, you have a shot to uh, flip the switch and become a really dangerous team down the stretch. But I don't know. This doesn't look like the team that it did last year, and I don't think they're consistent enough to win week over week in this conference. So I'm pretty comfortable saying Arizona's not going to be a player in this conference, but I'll hold my tongue just a little bit on that one just to make sure that everything kind of Maybe they lose this weekend and then it becomes a little bit more clear. But at the end of the day, Texas Tech playing really, really good football and Arizona just kind of missing the mark this year. Incredible weekend. No two ways about that. I think we'll kind of move forward from this weekend right after this next segment. We're going to get into some questions coming out of this weekend and kind of going into week seven. We'll break down all the different questions I have, including is there an elite team in college football? But I'll break it all down right after this, so stick with us.